thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me uh, to moderate this uh, panel along with my co-moderator, Dr. Anton Besselow from the Valdai Club. Well, as you all know, Dr. Anton Besselow is an expert of post-socialist Central Europe and is a media expert from Moscow. Uh, but joining us both is a star cast of three panelists. Each of them is so distinguished that I'm not going to waste any time introducing them to this uh, very large online audience. Uh, but in order as they speak, uh, we will be having with us first uh, the Honorable Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, who's been a keen China watcher and currently the president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. Our second panelist is the distinguished Dr. Marty Natalgawa, a career diplomat who was also Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. And last but not the least, we have the prolific Professor Kishore Mehbubani, uh, a civil servant, a career diplomat, an academic, who is now at uh, the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore. Uh, Prime Minister Rudd, uh, not to waste time, let me cut straight to the chase and uh, let us talk about the BIS global reset and the reboot in the midst of what you have described often, not as Cold War 2.0, but as Cold War 1.5. Now, at a time when the US-Russia Cold War is again resurgent, is there any sense, I'm asking you, in using the same cliché term to describe the US-China slugfest? Uh, was the U.S. onslaught on multilateralism and its institutions an aberration under Trump? Or do you think something has fundamentally changed about the United States and its position in the global order that President Biden is going to find extremely difficult to pull back from? Over to you, Prime Minister Raj. Well, thank you very much for the question. Greetings to our friends right around the world. And, of course, to our friends um, in Jakarta uh, and Indonesia. Good to be with... Um, Martin Atalagawa, uh, old friend, old colleague, um, and uh, of course with uh, Kishore Mahabani uh, from uh, Singapore. Um, and uh, greetings to uh, Anton uh, from uh, the Russian Federation. Um, you talk about um, old hackneyed phrases such as the Cold War or Cold War 2.0 to describe the US-China relationship. Uh, my simple argument is this. The US-China relationship, uh, even today, uh, cannot be characterized like the US relationship with the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. And there are a number of simple logical reasons for that. Uh, number one is, uh, during the Cold War between the Soviets uh, and the United States, uh, we had uh, mutually assured Armageddon between two uh, thermonuclear uh, uh, stockpiles targeted each other under a doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Yes, China has its own nuclear force, uh, but it is a second strike force. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it is not anything like the order of magnitude that the old Soviet Union or the current Russian Federation has. And the second point to be made is that the old Soviet Union and the United States had zero economic engagement. If you look across trade, investment, uh, capital markets, as well as uh, still even technology, talent uh, and product standards, there is a high degree of uh, engagement between the US and China. Now, thirdly, in the days of the old Cold War, there were literally dozens of proxy wars underway at any given time between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, in various parts of Africa, Latin America uh, and in parts of Asia. That is not the case at least at this stage, between China and the United States. And so, therefore, I think we need to be very careful before we haphazardly use this sort of language. Uh, it is a structurally tense relationship, and the structural reason for it is a change in the relative balance of power uh, between China and the United States. And that is, in turn, inducing different sets of behaviours by China and the United States in reaction to China. The final part of the answer to your question, I think, is this. And so what about the future of, let's call it, uh, the multilateral rules-based order uh, in the midst of this deep um, and pronounced um, challenge between the great powers, that is in Beijing uh, and in Washington? Well, the multilateral order uh, has become increasingly thin uh, in recent times, even preceding uh, the uh, election of the Trump administration. 
Certainly, the Trump administration has chosen unilaterally to walk away from a range of existing multilateral institutions. The Biden administration is committed to re-embracing those multilateral institutions. Uh, but what happens in terms of multilateral problem solving, be it through the G20, the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions, will still take a secondary place to the primary, as it were, engagement between the US and China uh, in what is what will become increasingly the dynamics of great power rivalry. And I conclude by saying this, the third countries, whether it's Indonesia, uh, whether it's the other countries of Southeast Asia, the rest of East Asia, South Asia, including our friends in Delhi, um, this will present an increasingly complex set of geopolitical challenges uh, as we move into an increasingly binary world when the rest of us by and large have chosen in the past to occupy a position in the international order, uh, which has sought to remain with open relationships with both Beijing and with Washington. That will become increasingly problematic. Uh, but for the decade ahead, I think it's imperative for third countries to do what they can to ameliorate to the extent possible this great power tension between the two um, powers in China and in the United States. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Kevin. That was great. Uh, and that really uh, gives me giving the chance to bring in Dr. Marty uh, from what you said about Dr. Marty, do you really feel, as uh, Kevin just said, that this is, uh, the, the, we, are, we are not, we are, we are going to be in this bilateral tussle. Now, does Indonesia, as a rising middle power in this new post-COVID world, but new to see itself as a regional leader, the voice of developing countries, an advocate for democracy? Or do you think now there is greater room to enhance its role as an important balancer in a world split in the way which uh, Prime Minister Rudd has described it? What can middle powers like Indonesia do to help enhance and advance the global reset if there's going to be one? Well, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm fortunate to speak after uh, Kevin. Uh, because I'm, I can basically echo and score uh, his description or his analysis of where we are now in terms of in terms of U.S.-China uh, dynamics. Uh, in a way, therefore, I think it's a it's a dynamic that this that defies a simple description uh, because it's so complex uh, and certainly, as Kevin had said, it's it's not like the the old uh, Cold War type of dynamics. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, a setting for the, for the present day, and we have to appreciate it using the present day prism, uh, so to speak. But uh, to your question, um, uh, that is actually the crux of the matter because we are we become quite quite uh, able to describe and even to analyze what's confronting us in terms of the U.S.-China competitive uh, dynamics, whether it be simply competitive or adversarial. It's a continuum. Uh, we are we are quite uh, well versed and able to describe and analyze it. But then the, the, the next question is, how are we going to respond or how are we going to, to behave uh, as third countries, so to speak, uh, in the face of such U.S.-China dynamics? Uh, and, and this is uh, uh, the key challenge that countries of the regions are, are facing, like Indonesia. Uh, I believe it's, it's not sufficient for countries to simply adopt like an equidistant uh, posture, uh, as long as they are in the middle, uh, non-committal, uh, not choosing between U.S. and, and China, and, and simply hope for the best. Uh, even recently, I've seen some ASEAN thoughts uh, uh, reviving the idea of a neutrality uh, amidst all this. I think uh, the best course of action would be a proactive one, uh, you know, because strategic autonomy that countries like Indonesia and ASEAN in general wish to uh, enjoy it has to be for a certain purpose. It can't be simply uh, lay, lying low and then hope for the best. And in this connection, I think the space uh, that countries like Indonesia occupy or, or the value adding it can bring is how to help stabilize the US-China uh, rivalries. How can we mitigate or manage the potential risks such as miscalculation of how small incidents can quickly uh, develop to become a major crisis? And I think there, there is room and, and scope for countries like Indonesia, ASEAN, to help find the modalities. How can we promote certain uh, uh, predictable behavior in this part of the world? 
Uh, you know, in, in essence, externalizing ASEAN's own experience, uh, building strategic trust uh, in the wider region between the US and China in, in particular. Uh, you know, I mean, I've spoken in the past of having a TAC-like uh, commitment to the non-use of force by the major countries. You know, I mean, to say essentially, irrespective of the problems or, or differences that they may have, ultimately, they commit themselves to resolve this through diplomatic way means. And secondly, uh, in a more, in a more, uh, you know, timely manner to establish a crisis management capacity. Because at the moment, uh, this part of the world is, is bereft of such a capacity. We have crisis occurring on a regular basis, uh, regular basis, and yet the most of the uh, regional architecture, the, the pace of their engagement is too regular, too uh, not thinking uh, in a more timely way. For instance, the, the, the East Asia Summit only convened last week. Uh, this is now in November of, a, of this given year at the summit level. Between January and, and November, things have happened. And yet there hasn't been any, any crisis management uh, uh, capacity being invoked by the East Asia Summit. In other words, to your question again, uh, countries like Indonesia can simply you know, express concern. We can simply complain and, and, and ex express exasperation. We have to offer concrete policy uh, recommendations. And, and the area where I think we can excel is in ways and means to promote strategic stability, predictability of behavior between US and China. And by the way, it's not only US and China. Uh, it is there are other bilaterals uh, that we need to be mindful of, including China, India, China, Japan, and many other axes, many other nexuses to be managed. Those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, with this, let me jump to Kishore. Uh, Kishore, uh, you are there. I, uh, I can see your backdrop. I know you have very tantalizingly, you are, you are trying to advertise your book, Has China Won? So let me help you sell this book. Uh, my question is, has China already won or really won? Has it rather not lost a golden opportunity to enhance its soft power post-COVID-19? I think it had a golden chance. But instead, it, it has chosen to become a nation which few countries are really trusting. And do you really seriously believe that you know, governments which have lesser democracy, not just within the country I'm talking about, but both within and between nations can really move into a proper multilateral world which needs other countries to be treated democratically and not unilaterally. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjoy. Uh, I expected nothing less but a very challenging uh, question from a fellow argumentative Indian. <laughs> uh, and I'm also very happy to uh, join the panel, my good friends, Kevin and Marty, and of course, thank Dino and his team for organizing a brilliant uh, event. So your, your question put simply, uh, has China won? And if you read my book, the answer, I shouldn't tell you because you won't buy the book, uh, is no, or more accurately, not yet. But if you look at trend lines and where we are going uh, in terms of China's uh, influence and impact on the world, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that China's uh, weight and influence in the world has grown uh, exponentially. And I would say that as we try to focus very much as you have done on what's happening in the last few months, COVID-19 and so on and so forth, we should also look at the larger long-term trends that are happening. And there are these three very clear, definable long-term trends that are actually driving the big picture. The first one, of course, is the return of Asia. And this is I've been writing about for 20, 30 years now. And as you know, from the year one to the year 1820, the two largest economies in the world were China and India. Only in the last 200 years, they went down. In 1950, they had 5% of the world's GNP, which is abnormal. Now they're coming back to their normal strength. So the return of China and India and the rest of Asia is the larger big picture of what's happening. And that is, of course, also one source of the discomfort that many in the West, including the United States, feel because they have to deal with a very different world than the one that they had over the last uh, 200 years. Secondly, specifically, uh, the book Has China Won is about the US-China uh, relationship. And I completely agree with Kevin that this is a result of a change in the balance of power 
uh, between the two, but there are also additional factors that are driving the, the, this, uh, this contest between uh, US and China. One is, of course, the fact that in the West, there's always been a fear of the yellow peril. And suddenly now to see the conceive of a world where the number one power is a non-Western yellow power is a very painful, emotional thing uh, for many. No one wants to talk about it, but it's a real factor that's driving the emotionalism. And third, of course, the, the, the one mistake that the Chinese have made is to create a bipartisan consensus uh, in the United States against China. So even though Joe Biden has become president, you will have on the one hand, everything changing with the Biden presidency. On the other hand, nothing changing with the Biden presidency because his hands are tied. There is a, a rock solid uh, anti-China consensus uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. But the other third point I'm going to make about the big changes that have happened is that if you if you look at the effective uh, interconnections uh, between China uh, and the rest of the world, what is interesting is that on the substantive side, the relationship between China and a whole host of countries is growing very, very significantly. And, you know, the simple example of this is the Belt and Road Initiative, which is which the countries are free to join or not join. There are 193 countries in the world. U.S. hasn't joined, India hasn't joined, Japan hasn't joined, Australia hasn't joined, but 127 countries have joined out of the 190 countries. And it's a, it's a voluntary choice. But I would say the real game changer, and I hope you'll spend some time discussing it today, if you want to get, a, in a sense, a glimpse of the world in 2050, look at the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And at a time when the United States just cannot sign any free trade agreements now, it's completely toxic, you just had the world's largest, one of the world's largest free trade agreements being completed in, 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 in a, at a time when everything else in the world is not working. So that, I would say, that you can have the RCEP is a sign of how, in a sense, to answer your question very, very directly, China is winning. Uh, thank you, Kishore, and thank you for actually bringing us precisely on to the RCEP and the, sign, the significance of the signing of the RCEP, which I agree is an extremely important step. Now, uh, my next question is actually addressed to all three panelists, and I would like your reactions to uh, this next question of mine, which takes off on the RCEP. Yes, on 15 November, between phase one and phase two, the timing is important. Between phase one and phase two of the Malabar exercises, which the Quad was undertaking, in the same region, 15 nations came together to sign the largest free trade agreement which you're describing. Do you see this irony or do you see this as poetic justice? I mean, that is, that is my question to all the panelists. Or is it that the so-called, you know, the, the supposed alliance of democracies continues to live in an extremely confused, complex and befuddling world, its leaders do not really know what to make of? On the one hand, yes, you have security arrangements coming up. Uh, which certain countries seem to think are ranged against them. On the other hand, you have trade agreements coming up. So this whole dispute between guns and butter is going on. But people seem to be knowing which side their bread is buttered in all this. Is that correct? Kevin, let me start with you. Well, let me um, uh, note of skepticism about RCEP. Um, and, uh, and I know our good friends in Delhi thought that RCEP was... Um, far too vigorous a free trade agreement to join. But that says something about our friends in Delhi and their attitude to free trade in general. Um, and uh, it's been quite a while since uh, India signed up to uh, free trade agreements uh, uh, of uh, any particular type. And I think we understand the domestic reasons for that within Indian politics and the economy. Uh, and the robust posture of the Indian Commerce Department which is unlikely to be dragged kicking and screaming to sign any free trade agreement anytime soon. But leaving aside the fact that India is outside the, um, the remit of, uh, of RCEP, reflect for a moment that RCEP, uh, when you look at it against uh, any analysis of a robust free trade agreement uh, in terms of free flow of goods and services and uh, investment capital, uh, is uh, not a, quote, high quality agreement. It is a relatively low quality agreement. Uh, and therefore, there is an open question in my mind, substantively, the extent to which RCEP will increase uh, the level of uh, intra-regional economic connectedness uh, than would otherwise be the case. 
I think at a geopolitical level, RCEP has some significance because as uh, Kishore and others have pointed out, it has been brought into being uh, at a time of, as it were, pan-global protectionism, pan-global recession, uh, and at a time of a binary conflict between China and the United States. Uh, but I think we should be very cautious before we attribute to RCEP uh, something which uh, is uh, the new nirvana of free trade uh, across the Asia-Pacific region. That's, I think, uh, the, the first point. The second, though, in terms of, let's call it, to use Pak Mahi's um, phrase, uh, how th third countries respond to the central strategic and economic dimensions of the US-China relationship, and to use uh, you, your phrase, uh, Sun Joyce, which is managing the guns and butter of that particular dynamic. Uh, the truth is we have three sets of um, responses. In classical international relations theory, we'll have those uh, who are beginning to uh, uh, balance against one of the uh, great powers, the rising power, um, in this case, China. And we know which countries they are across uh, the wider region. Um, and I think uh, Malabar uh, kind of partly answers that question. Uh, then you have those who may be uh, going in the other direction prescribed by international relations theory. That is those who are bandwagoning already uh, with what is perceived to be the rising power, largely to Shaw's point about has China won? And uh, people looking at the economic trajectory of China's rise through the mid-century and reaching their own bandwagoning conclusions. But there is a third set of responses as well, which is the complexities of, shall we say, variable bilateral and multilateral geometries as people seek to have differential engagements with the US and China across both security and economic domains in this um, murky period of the decade which is unfolding. My concluding point, and it reinforces again a point made before by Pakmati, is given the above and given these, as it were, aggregate tendencies of balancing, bandwagoning, or shall we say multiple uh, variable geometries, there is a responsibility for the rest of us, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region or the Indo-Pacific region, to think about ways in which we can militate against the absolute uh, binaryization of everything. And that brings us back to the absence in the Asia-Pacific region of anything approximating a useful uh, piece of, uh, of uh, security architecture which can bring about levels of confidence and security building measures which at a minimum don't produce conflict by accident at this time of uh, great uh, geopolitical instability. That's where the EAS, the East Asian Summit, began this process in 2005 in the Kuala Lumpur Declaration. It is uh, where many of us uh, in the period since then have sought to add to that architecture. Um, we at the Asia Society produced a piece on this with Pak Mahdi's help about five years ago, which is taking the EAS architecture and unfolding it into a broader concept of an Asia-Pacific community to militate against the binary security and economic dynamics, which we're beginning to see unfold without anything, move, without anything militating against it uh, in the overall uh, dynamics of the US-China relationship. Enjoy, can I come in now? Can I play with Martin? Yeah. yeah, can yes. I bring uh, Martin and then I'll come to you, Kishore. I have a specific yeah. question for you. Okay. Uh, Martin, yeah. uh, my question, yeah. uh, this is, is basically the same question to you, Marty. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but after uh, hearing Kevin, what I'd like to ask you is, uh, this whole issue of security, concerns, expansionist designs, on the other hand, you, you have this unilateral push, but the big push for trade which is happening in the region, do you think there is a positive there or are there still deep concerns which countries like Indonesia have? Well, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd like to respond, if I may, uh, by, by linking it to this very important uh, development over the past few days, namely the signing of RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, at the risk of being oversimplifying uh, the facts, uh, Actually, if one were to actually look at what the origins or the genesis of uh, RCEP, uh, it is very much an ASEAN initiated idea. Uh, it was as early as 2011 when ASEAN came up with the notion of a framework 
for a regional comprehensive economic partnership and then subsequently in the, in the year after 2012 uh, the uh, the other uh, non asean countries rally around it and then for the past eight years we've been working on it and the idea that it is uh, essentially it may perhaps one day become essentially more china dom dominated but i don't think it is uh, quite right to, to describe it as being so at the moment uh, as if this is a, 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 you know um, something a mechanism modality that will be dominated by by china because if you think about it at the time of rcep's uh, initiation there were a number of competing uh, ideas out there. China's main uh, comfort level was the idea of having an East Asia free trade area, a free trade area that basically limits itself only to ASEAN plus three. That is their preferred modality because within that setup, clearly China would be the most, uh, the most dominant economy uh, uh, within it. Ch uh, at the same time, Japan had the comprehensive economic partner uh, partnership idea in East Asia. The same composition as the East Asia Summit, but it is Japan initiated. And at the time, uh, you know, countries of ASEAN felt, unless we were proactive, we will become sidelined. Hence, we, we, we proposed the idea of this RCEP. After all, the initial idea of RCEP was to, to encompass only countries with whom ASEAN has free trade agreement basically like East Asia Summit minus US and Russia. Uh, but then even that possibility is still uh, left open. And to have India from the beginning was extremely important. It addresses the, the uh, limitations of APEC, uh, for instance. And, and at the same time, uh, during that period, there was the TPP as well, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which some ASEAN countries were engaged in. In other words, for countries like Indonesia, from the vantage point of 2011, we push for RCEP as a way to ensure continued ASEAN centrality and, 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 and in, a, in, a, in a driving seat role. And hence, we have what we have. Unfortunately, in the, in the, in the final uh, moments, uh, India chose to, to opt out. But I do hope, hope that uh, uh, the prospect of India one day joining on even Russia and, and United States uh, 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 it's not completely close, but the whole idea is we sort of like, for want of a better term, dilute China's uh, preponderant possibilities by having economies of Japan, economies of Australia, New Zealand as part of the pot. I mean, I used the term in the past, a dynamic equilibrium, not containing China, but putting China's rise in a wider context. Uh, it is not only about economics, it, is, it has always been about geopolitics, RCEP in my view, but uh, it would be a sad uh, development for ASEAN having introduced the idea if they were to give, to give, to give, to give up uh, leading it. And as a result, uh, the forum, the process becomes precisely as uh, Pakishore said, becomes uh, China dominated. But it doesn't have to be, but it requires ASEAN to actually you know, continue to invest in the process and not to simply, uh, you know, I mean, uh, drop back from, from their initial initiative. Thank you. Okay, Kishore, now you can have your say, you can respond to Kevin, you can respond to Marty, uh, but okay. also respond to me. My, my specific question on this, this, this theme itself is, uh, mm -hmm. yes, you know, there is, there is this conflict so-called between trade and security. Some see it as conflict, some don't see it as a conflict. Now, do you see any ground for optimism that in the post-COVID world, governments will be forced to change tack, de-escalate military development programs, and turn more to welfare, to the health of the citizens as primary concerns, or we're going to see more business as usual and the reset will not really be a reset? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I listened very, very carefully to what Kevin and Marty said. And I must say, having listened very carefully, I agree with every word they said, both of them. But I hope that what I'm going to give uh, is will complement what Kevin and, 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 and Marty have just said about RCEP and also answer your question about the guns and butter uh, issue that you, that you raised. And I, I want to say that there, there are three very significant di additional dimensions of the RCEP. The first is that there were basically three visions for the future of this region floating around. There was the Asia-Pacific vision, 
launched with Bob, by Bob Hopper of Australia in APAC and uh, supported by Bill Clinton, the first APAC leaders meeting, carried on by Obama with the TPP. And as you know, that vision came to a grinding hall when the United States walked out of the TPP. What happened to the Asia Pacific? And then there was, of course, an alternative vision which the Trump administration was pushing of the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, there are two Indo-Pacific visions, the Indonesian one, which I completely support and endorse. But the other Indo-Pacific vision was to bring India in to make it part of the regional architecture. And frankly, RCEP was the most important way of bringing India into the game, as, as, as Kevin was hinting at. And in this, even this low-level agreement, India couldn't sign. And that was a shock to everybody. This is, as, as Kevin said, this is not a very high-level agreement. Okay, this is a very low-level, easy agreement for countries uh, uh, to sign. So that that Indo-Pacific legs were cut off also by that. So that leaves, by the way, an East Asian economic system that is developing very, very significantly. So the second point I'm going to make about RCEP to reinforce what Marty said: uh, people have, have people haven't realized that the only reason why RCEP happened is because. Only ASEAN can and has signed agreements with Australia, New Zealand, with South Korea, with Japan and China. And guess what? The three biggest economies in the region, China, Japan, uh, South Korea. And you know what? They couldn't sign an agreement with each other because of all the suspicions. But under the cloak and guise of RCEP, they have now created something for them to cooperate. And that's a big game changer. When these three economies now can co collaborate more, and a lot of the growth that you're going to see, the economic growth you're going to see, uh, it's going to come from China, Japan, and Korea opening up uh, doors to themselves under the cover uh, of uh, RCEP. But the third and, and, and final point is that going back to your question about guns and butter, at the end of the day, it's always about butter. It's about your economic uh, game that uh, ultimately determines where you stand in, in the world. And just, you know, I don't know the, to use a very important statistic. In 1980, the size of the Indian GNP was the same size as the Chinese GNP, exactly same size. Today, 2020, the Chinese GNP is five times the size. And we can go into all kinds of reasons why that happened. But one clear reason is that China decided to integrate itself uh, with the world order. And you know, as Xi Jinping said in his uh, 2017 January speech, China plunged into the choppy waters of globalization, drank water, struggled to swim, but they learned from globalization. And the thing, the, 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 the most important point I'm going to make to you, Sanjoy, is that we Indians are the most competitive economic race in the world. If you look at how well the Indians do in the most competitive laboratory in the world, the United States of America, there are no Chinese running Google, there are no Chinese running uh, uh, Microsoft, it's Indians running it. The rest of the world should be frightened of India joining the global competition. But as Kevin said, your Ministry of Commerce wants to lock up India and keep, it, keep the Indian economy shut. And guess what? When you keep the Indian economy shut, you, you don't roll. So at the end of the day, if India wants to win the game and wants to be, be a player in, the, in this region, you've got to make these difficult steps and say, OK, I can plunge in and succeed. And I can assure you with the Indian economy, opens up and decides to compete, the rest of the world will be very frightened. But amazingly, you shut yourself off. So one, one small suggestion, ask yourself a very simple question. How is it these 10 ASEAN countries, uh, relatively weak, not big GNPs, how did they become such a game-changing player? And how is it that ASEAN was the one that generated and delivered our set? So on your question about the post-COVID-19 world, I have a specific suggestion, which I hope Marty will pass on, that the 10 ASEAN countries should not wait for the post-COVID-19 world to come. The 10 ASEAN ambassadors should go to Washington, D.C. now and collectively tell United States and send the same message to China, we have more important things to do in the world. COVID-19 has got to be killed first. You have a pause in your geopolitical contest. Let's get together and kill COVID-19 completely. And then we can go back to the normal world. That's the sort of things that we can do. We shouldn't just be passive about these things. We should be proactive in dealing with these matters. Uh, Kishore, you almost tempted me to jump in as panelist, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to have the time to do all that. I'm a moderator. I'm going to stay to a moderator. Uh, guns <laughs> and butter, yes, the debate goes on. Uh, the problem is that some people's guns are butter for somebody else. So gun the guns and butter debate is not really as binary as we make it out to be. 
but we are passing on to the uh, question and answer session. Uh, for that, I would like to invite my co-moderator, Anton, to take over from it. Anton, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sunjoy, for passing me the moderating rights. And my first question to our distinguished panelists will be on the legacy of the Trump administration. I think the two things that it will be re remembered for in Asia will be the sanctions war with China and the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, do you think it can change under Biden? Is there a chance that the sanctions against China will be alleviated or totally removed, especially the sanctions in the tax sphere? And also, is there a chance for the United States to joining the TPP-11 in the near future? There were some hints from, from the Trump administration that it might happen, but do you think it might happen under Biden? So I'll first ask uh, Kevin to uh, uh, address this issue. Thank you very much, uh, Anton. By the way, as I answer this, um, let me add 15 seconds to one of Shaw's answers before. He said the world would be uh, frightened if India joined uh, RCEP or more broadly um, embraced uh, the principles of uh, globalization and free trade. I think the world would be delighted uh, if uh, India did so, and certainly Asia would be as well, and I think Southeast Asia. Um, is in fact the, uh, the absence of India from APEC, the absence of India from RCEP, the absence of India from, let's call it, the full-scale integration with the economies of East Asia, uh, which is the missing element in the overall strategic uh, jigsaw and the overall geoeconomics of the future. Uh, to go to Anton's uh, specific questions about Trump and Trump legacy, I think it's fair to say that across uh, wider uh, uh, the wider Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific, depending on your geopolitical choice, there's been a collective sigh of relief about the election of the Biden administration, simply because uh, following the roller coaster ride of the Trump administration, uh, even for our friends in Beijing, has been a, um, has been a perplexing experience. Um, and uh, I think, therefore, an anticipation of a level of sobriety, a level of predictability, uh, a level of, shall we say, normalcy in American global conduct um, would be uh, welcomed by most, if not all, countries across the wider region. Second point that you specifically asked, will a Biden administration uh, repeal any of the existing trade sanctions against China, uh, by which we mean the um, uh, particular uh, constraints imposed on individual Chinese firms and, for example, the tariff measures which have been imposed as part of the trade war, I do not see that as likely um, because of the nature of the bipartisan sentiment in the United States Congress against China, which Kishore and others have referred to. On the second question you raised, Anton, which uh, related to the future of the TPP, uh, despite the protectionism which lies very much at the base of the Democrat Party uh, and the labor unions in particular, um, but also on the part of some uh, rural Republicans. Uh, we should not be surprised if the TPP by another name becomes a vehicle through which the Biden administration engages uh, the TPP economies. Let's call it the TPP 11. Um, I think that is at least an even money bet. Uh, if you wish to see a paper on this subject, my colleague Wendy Cutler, the vice president of our Asia Policy Institute, on the Asia Society website, produced a piece on this about six weeks ago. It's a good piece of analysis. Um, and thirdly, um, on the question of uh, where uh, the Biden administration goes more broadly, and let's call it on Southeast Asia, here is the problem, as I see it, for this administration. Uh, Trump, by and large, couldn't be bothered to turn up at EAS and APEC meetings. It sends a huge American message uh, to Asia that we weren't all that interested, that is, we the United States. Um, the Biden administration, if you look at those who are most likely to take the most senior positions, people like Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Michelle Flournoy and the others, these, are deep, these individuals are deeply familiar uh, with wider East Asia, South Asia, uh, as well as Southeast Asia. So I think you're going to see a change in this sense. The United States will be turning up and attending in a way in which was frankly characteristic of previous US administrations. But here is the caveat. Our friends in Southeast Asia will carry with them a level of residual skepticism about whether the United States will 
turn into a revolving door of, as it were, isolationist Republicans, followed by globalist Democrats, followed by isolationist Republicans, followed by global Repu uh, globalist Democrats, in a cycle into the future, reflecting the unfolding dynamics of US domestic society uh, and uh, politics. It'll be Biden's domestic challenge to remove that as simply a, a, a cyclical phenomenon in American politics and return it to a bipartisan trajectory for the future. If he governs effectively domestically and removes uh, the core elements giving rise to American populism, there is a chance, a real chance, the United States will resume and continue a sophisticated uh, global engagement, regional engagement, including in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Kevin. May I address the same uh, question to Marty, please? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Anton, and uh, obviously underscore the points that uh, Kevin had said uh, before. If I may add some, some other elements, uh, aside from the obvious, I think the, the Kevin's point about the um, US absenteeism uh, in various regional ASEAN-led initiatives have been extremely uh, damaging uh, to US. The, the, the impression of U.S. Eng engagement in this part of the world. Uh, so that, that, that is uh, quite an obvious uh, 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 legacy. But one, one rather interesting legacy, I thought if, I, if one was to be in this kind of uh, uh, mode, is how Trump uh, changed the, an important lexicon, an important terminology in this part of the world. Uh, his usage of the term Indo-Pacific, uh, rather than Asia Pacific, as traditionally has been the case, was uh, rather game changing. I think for, for, for it's not a new phenomenon, a new terminology in this part of the world. Indonesia has certainly propagated in 2013 uh, and even before, Australia certainly. But uh, the United States, uh, President Trump, by making it as, a, as one of his key uh, uh, signature uh, outlook, uh, in a way, sort of uh, push start many of the pre-existing uh, initiatives in this part of the world, ASEAN already had a vision, already had an idea uh, before, but then because Trump chose to uh, take it up, I think in a way that sort of forced ASEAN's hand uh, to be a bit more proactive in coming up with a so-called Indo-Pacific uh, outlook. So I think the Indo-Pacific uh, 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 is one one term or one, out, one area where Trump has been quite uh, impactful. Uh, I'd, I'd like to also highlight the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I mean, you know, this was uh, without doubt, in my view, one of those uh, potentially, well, many had hoped, a rather unconventional, disruptive, but hopefully things will changing the dynamics in a positive way. Uh, certainly, President Trump uh, didn't follow the conventions uh, insofar as dealing with uh, DPRK was concerned, and many of us, at least I felt, uh, this, uh, that perhaps this is one way of disrupting uh, and changing the dynamics uh, in uh, on the issue. Unfortunately, it hasn't, you know, resulted in in the uh, in in the progress that we some of us may have hoped. Uh, it may be the case that uh, the uh, U.S. North Korea relations may be still going through some difficulties, but I was at least hoping that process could have instilled a Northeast Asia regional uh, process, not unlike in Southeast Asia, because Southeast Asia, like Northeast Asia, at one time was a region divided perfectly along Cold War divisions, etc. Uh, I was, uh, you know, there was a potential that uh, uh, President Trump's rather unconventional and disruptive uh, methodology in Northeast Asia could usher in a new dynamics that between the two Koreas, between even between DPRK and Japan, there was signs of some kind of a rapprochement uh, between Japan and Russia, uh, Russia and DPRK. In, in other words, it was a potentially, uh, 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 you know, game-changing uh, juncture. But somehow it became more for show. It was more the optics rather than the substance. And the whole thing now is beginning to uh, to. Uh, uh, dissipate. So I think uh, aside from the point that as uh, Kevin had mentioned, I wanted to highlight to reinforce the sense of absenteeism of uh, President Trump, which I hope will, will be uh, done away with. The Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, I think, was an important legacy that he had left, he, that he is leaving. 
the Korean Peninsula Northeast Asia dynamic was a potential, but unfortunately hasn't quite borne fruit. And of President Biden's administration, uh, besides doing the simple things, namely just turning up to various uh, you know regional meetings, uh, I'm hopeful and I'm hoping that there is a, a more comprehensive U.S. engagement. Uh, it's not no longer only transactional mercantilist economic uh, orientation or the use of economic instruments for geopolitical ends, but the United States engage in the full uh, facets of its uh, strength, including uh, in the area of uh, uh, good governance uh, and democracy. I think over the po past four or five years, uh, if not more, we've seen a, a really uh, uh, you know, disquieting uh, reversal in some of the democratic gains that our region have made. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. And now I'd like to turn to Kishore, who beautifully described the dominating attitude in the US Congress as rock solid anti-China consensus. So I think I know what your answer on the sanctions issue will be. But still, uh, is there any chance for US-China relations to have less tension under the Biden administration? Well, I would say, you know, the, the, it's going to be a paradoxical relationship, you know, between US and China. And that's why it's very complex. And we should try and understand that complexity. On the one hand, of course, uh, Biden's election changes everything. And I'm glad Kevin emphasized this, that that you will have a very stable, calm, predictable, rational actor once again, which, is, which frankly the region will welcome a lot. Uh, they, they will stop insulting China in the way that the Trump administration did. Uh, they will continue engaging China and talking to China. So in that sense, the tone and tenor of the whole administration uh, will change. Uh, but on the other hand, as I said, even though, every, even though everything has changed, Nothing has changed too, because the, there is, as I mentioned, a rock solid consensus in Washington DC. And you know, for example, I was told this morning, I was talking to another Zoom group with some people in Washington DC, and they told me that there's this legislation that the US Congress passed on Hong Kong was passed unanimously, unanimously, completely, not one, not one dissenting vote. And that, that's a very powerful signal uh, of the uh, consensus over there. So this obviously there's been a very strong consensus to take on uh, China, which I think is not going to change uh, very easily. So what, where does that leave the, the, the rest of us? And I, yeah, I'm very glad that Marty has also emphasized this, that they, and, and Kevin too, that hopefully the Biden administration has got very seasoned hands and, and Kevin mentioned some of the most important players. They know East Asia very well. But it's very important that they come here and listen carefully to what people here are saying. The first point to note is that Asia in 2020 is in a different place from Asia in 2016 that they left behind. It's a different Asia. Things have changed significantly. And, and, and just for COVID-19, by the way, I want to emphasize an a important psychological factor here. Everybody here is very surprised how incompetently the United States has managed COVID-19. It's actually quite stunning. The denial of science, the explosion of cases. And here, you know, if, you, if, if everyone in the region sees what's happening between US and China, if the United States had the same number of deaths per capita from COVID-19 as China did, Instead of having 240,000 deaths, the United States would have less than 1,000 deaths. That's a very startling gap in terms of competence and handling of this. So if the United States came and listened to countries in the region, what they will hear is a two-part message. Part one message is, we love you, United States. I mean that quite seriously. There are huge reservoirs of goodwill towards the United States in Southeast Asia. The most important fact to know about the United States and Southeast Asia is that the United States has invested more in Southeast Asia than China, Japan, uh, South Korea uh, combined. Amazing, right? Statistic. So there is huge reservoirs of goodwill here in, in Southeast Asia towards, uh, towards the United States. So if the United States came here, it would find so everybody is going to welcome the United States with open arms. But at the same time, the equally strong message will come is don't ask us to choose between US and China. 
we cannot choose. We have good ties with the United States, but we also have equally important ties with China, as demonstrated by the uh, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And at the, at the same time, the primary goal of the Southeast Asian governments today, especially after COVID-19, is economic growth. The United States cannot provide the engine to drive economic growth in Southeast Asia. The engine that will drive economic growth in Southeast Asia is China. And, and let me end with one statistic which you should all know about. In 2010, the size of the retail goods market in China was 1.8 trillion. The size of the retail goods market in US was 4 trillion, double that of China. By 2019, China's global retail, retail goods market had become 6 trillion. The United States is still around 4 trillion. So you can see where the growth is going to come that was going to drive this uh, uh, tremendous growth in Southeast Asia. So the United States got to understand that the, is, is, it, it will find lots of friends here, but don't make its friends choose between US and China. Thank you very much, Kishore, for your insights. And thank you all the panelists for, your, for this wonderful discussion. Let me close our session with some remarks. Coming back to the title, to the question, the title of this session is a world of less rivalry and more, more cooperation possible? I don't think we've gotten a definitive answer to this question. Probably if the major stakeholders have the political will to make the world more safe and more cooperative, it will be. And I think Asia has a very important role to play here with its unique ability to find common ground, to find compromise, to, with its unwillingness to take sides in rivalries. I think uh, it can push the major stakeholders to behave in a more responsible and more cooperative way. So thank you very much once again. And let me remind you that the global town hall marathon goes on and the next session will be in 10 minutes. Thank you.